Wetlands Program Leader with the Wildlife Division of Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. So my position is statewide. I supervise uh, some of our employees who oversee some of our uh, incentive programs, the Landowner Incentive Program and the Pastures for Upland Birds Program, which help landowners do work on their private lands for threatened and endangered species or for prairie restoration. Uh, and then I also oversee our farm bill biologist who is our liaison with the Natural Resource Conservation Service, the NRCS, and how they implement the various farm bill programs. And so he informs our staff and landowners about those programs, breaks them down, and then also uh, gives input on the wildlife side of things to NRCS as they set forth policy, both nationally, regionally, and in Texas. So uh, beyond that, uh, most of my career, I've worked on private lands. I went to school over in Nacogdoches in East Texas, I grew up in Giddings, um, and just enjoy being outside in general with a real focus on prairie restoration, threatened and endangered species. And then uh, now, uh, as I get further into my career, uh, more and more on policy, unfortunately, which means less time outside and more time in meetings. But uh, Presentation we're going to go over today from mammalogy. Um, it's usually a two and a half for three hour course. I have an endocrinology appointment for my daughter uh, that got bumped up by an hour from what it was supposed to be, and otherwise we'll have to meet in a month and a half. So I apologize, but I'm going to probably cut out about ten or ten o five uh, in order to make her appointment by ten thirty. So our goals for the class today: familiarize ourselves with the mammals of Texas, as you may know already. Uh, most of those are rats, mice, and bats. Um, they're not quite as visible or desirable for some folks as some of our more charismatic larger species like white-tailed deer or javelinas, bobcats, coyotes, etc. but they are the most numerous. So a lot of this is just introduction to those species and where they occur. Uh, I hate to say it, but virtually it's gonna be pretty bland <laughs> and I'll try to try to make it a little more colorful. But we'll see how I'll do the best I can. Uh, but again, understand this is only a two hour course today or one and a half hour course instead of three. And I can't cover every mammal that happens to occur in Texas. And we're not going to go over trapping, uh, at, but uh, something that you can definitely get some more information on if you seek it um, through various online resources. So with that, we'll get it kicked off. So the history of mammalogy, <clears throat> when we look at humans and other mammals, uh, we usually look at it from the sense of if we go back into prehistory, we've been studying mammalogy for a long time. When they were our food source, we had to know their habits, where they would occur, at what times of year they would occur there, what times of day they would occur. And so humans have been studying other mammals for a long period of time, either as a food source or to know how not to become the food source uh, for certain predators. Um, over time, we've sort of removed ourselves from that system now uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. But if you've all been keeping track, there have been a record number of uh, of grizzly bear attacks this year already in parts of the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem and in Canada. They've already had uh, five attacks um, this early in the year up there and going on. So when we put ourselves back in those systems, we can still have some pretty uh, top of the food chain down interactions with other mammals when they do occur. Uh, early records and interest in those species are documented through cave paintings, some of them even from Neanderthals, going back over 30,000 years in parts of Europe and places like that where it's been documented. Linda mentioned early Waco tanks out there in West Texas where there's uh, pictographs out there. I've seen them over near Terlingua as well, drawings that are um, further back, you know, two, 3,000 years old showing bison and, and pronghorn and things like that out in West Texas. So. Um, definitely something that's been a part of the human experience for as long as we've been around. So hunting strategies, how did they hunt them? Well, one of the ways we've actually discovered a lot of these species in certain areas is the driving method where they would actually, they didn't have tools capable of taking down these large megafauna that occurred during the last ice age. You can think about mastodons, woolly mammoths, uh, the proto bison, the very large longhorn bison that occurred before the modern plains bison. Uh, they would actually drive them off of cliffs. And at the bottom of these cliffs, they, they've they been able to determine uh, that humans did this because there's large numbers and the bones would have cut marks on them and signs that they had been, you know, processed and taken apart for uh, for food. 
with <coughs> signs of working by tools. Um, the other way is, you know, they try to funnel them through a narrow passage where hills or rocky areas came through. And when they were forced to go through there, they could either club them or stab them in order to, to get them there. So uh, early behavior and movement patterns the survival of humans. So that's part of the theory of how the Americas were colonized initially by hunter gatherers as they were following these roving herds of large mammals, which were the primary food source. And through that, we're able to colonize uh, North and South America uh, at some point in the recent past. So interest in mammals, of course, expeditions across the world increased the popularity, new species were discovered. Um, you know, they were written about fantastic beasts from around the world were brought in from collections and zoos and so on and increased people's uh, curiosity and want to go see them use them as uh, commercial products. If you think about when folks came to North America, what was the primary driver of trade for the first almost 300 years after North America was discovered? It was really the fur trade. So, uh, you know, everybody knows the stories of beavers, how they were extirpated from a lot of the area. The extirpation of beavers actually followed with the introduction of non-native species like the nutria from South America for the fur trade, foxes, martens, Pine martens, wolverines, all those different things, those winter coats uh, were a primary driver for French fur traders, uh, for Native American tribes, and the way they gained wealth from Europeans and got trade goods. A lot of it revolved around the fur trade for mammals and shaped, you know, human history. And when uh, Lewis and Clark even did their exp expedition out west, a lot of the folks who went on that expedition after they were done they were hired on by these fur trading companies in St. Louis and led expeditions back up the Missouri River to go trap. Uh, and that was their value. Of course, then a lot of them ended up getting killed by Native Americans shortly within the years thereafter. But uh, uh, the, that mammal trade uh, drove the westward expansion and drove a lot of that we wealth on the American frontier um, from the 18 teens up until about the 1840s when a uh, large portion of the uh, Trapping had extirpated the primary cash crop, which was beavers. So, if you think about it from another history standpoint, if you go back and if you think about the Carthaginians and bringing the Ro the war elephants into Rome, you know they've been used in all parts and shaped uh, our world today. So, if we look at the U.S. and getting back to Lewis and Clark, actually Louisiana, Louisiana purchase in 1803. Uh, Lewis and Clark were sent westward as a part of an expedition uh, to one, see what the new lands held, uh, their development potential, but also to describe the, the habitat and habits of the species there and the resources that may have been held. And so they were the first to describe uh, many mammals that were new or relatively undescribed to science. Um, and so you think about pronghorn, grizzly bears, um, Eastern wood rats, black tailed prairie dogs, and so on. Uh, the journals that they kept were some of the first records, detailed records of these species, other than word of mouth. Uh, trappers, fur traders, and whalers, you know, just like as we discussed earlier, a lot of these were used for clothing. If you, you know, by Mr. Evers, it says there. Uh, whalers, you know, up until really the large scale production of kerosene and petroleum products in the late 1800s, uh, whale, whale oil from the rendering of their fat was one of the primary uses was to for lighting uh, and use as a general uh, uh, means of working uh, after dark in the northern U.S. And so the advent of petroleum products actually saved some of our mammalian species that have been hunted to near extinction uh, during that time when they were no longer used as a fuel source. So, mammalogy is a distinct discipline. These are some of the names that you'll see commonly. Uh, if you do any research or if you get that into, we'll go into binomial nomenclature here in a minute, talking about the scientific names. You'll see at water eye or bailey eye or Miriam's, you know, Miriam's pocket gopher or Miriam's this or that. These are the folks that collected, documented, measured, uh, separated these species into the into what they are. And so Nationally, Joseph Cornell, E. Raymond Hall, William Hamilton, and if you look at from a prim primate perspective, Diana uh, Fossey, 
uh, were all those who really focused on mammalogy and really the description of species. In Texas, uh, Seahart Miriam, Vernon Bailey, H.P. Atwater, and David Schmidley were those who followed the natural history, described these species, kind of delineated where they occurred, what habitats they might be found in, their general measurements uh, reflecting uh, the size you might expect to find them in, then differentiations that separated these species from one another across their distributions in Texas. They also were the ones who collected one of the primary means of doing this in the past was by collecting or basically catching, killing, stuffing, and sending to a, um, a, a basically these large universities or research centers where collections occurred, where they could be described and categorized and placed within our uh, classification system to see where they fell uh, in the family tree of life. And so today, we really look at these collections and descriptions. One of the things that we know from the descriptions and collections they did back when Texas was much less people than and the U.S. was uh, had a much smaller population and there were still more intact things is <clears throat> we know where these things occurred. So take, for instance, uh, plains bison, black bears and mountain lions and jaguars in Texas. All of these things are nowhere near their past distribution. There may be occasional transients that come through, uh, generally juvenile or just young male dispersing individuals from those populations. Uh, but you're not gonna see roving herds of bison throughout the Texas Panhandle all the way down to the Gulf Coast, or even South Texas as there were 150, 250 years ago. And so knowing that they occurred there is something that, you know, it's like what impact did those used to have on the system? How would they, uh, have impacted the habitat, how they have impacted the other things that occur there, whether they be predators or something even as simple as, you know, the one of the things that we we are focused on right now in the high plains of Texas is the Texas kangaroo rat. And so this is a species that's on great decline. And the thought is that most of the place they occur now is on graded county road roadsides, uh, very short vegetation graded down to nothing. And the thought is that in the past, historic fires, followed by heavy bison grazing, grazing chasing those fires, created these spotty landscapes across the high plains that they could seek out and have big enough uh, uh, breeding events where they could subsist until the next fire and the next bison grazing event would come through and knock it down. So overgrazing actually tends to favor that species, but it's not something we want to do on a large scale due to water quality, soil quality, so on. So it's tough to replicate those things that used to happen on a broad scale on a land ownership scale now for something like that. Um, from a food perspective, obviously animal husbandry, most of the primary species of meat that we eat other than chicken and turkey primarily comes from mammals, goats, sheep, cattle, uh, pigs, and so on. So very important there. Medical science, as we've just come out from a pandemic, we all know that animals can be reservoirs or vectors for disease. Anybody who's read about feral hogs and the various diseases they can carry, such as brucellosis and pseudorabies and so other things, those can have a big impact on being transmitted to livestock and causing financial losses, as well as, you know, we all have to be on the lookout occasionally for rabies in general. We know there's coyotes and, and skunks and raccoons can all carry different variants of rabies, which none of us as humans want to get because it can be fatal if you don't get the shot in time. And then as pests, so anybody who's in an agrarian, agrarian landscape in Texas has seen wild hogs do a tremendous amount of damage either to farm fields, hay fields, um, various pasture land that loses grazing due to rooting activities and things such as that. Uh, and then anybody who's been around uh, livestock feeding operations knows that there can be a tremendous amount of raccoons that also enjoy the benefits of unlimited creep feed and other various types of grain distributed for livestock. Uh, and then as a, you know, we talk about, you can talk about sports or sport hunting or uh, game management. Um, this is a multi-billion dollar industry in Texas and across the nation. And that drives most of my funding and the funding for Parks and Wildlife Wildlife Divisions comes from the excise tax on, hunt, on uh, uh, ammo and gun sales. And that is a match for the Pittman-Robertson Act that Hunting license sales dollars have been matched with a three to one rate 
and that funds most of the activities for almost all game agencies, parks and wild, or wildlife agencies across the continental US. So hunting is a very important component of that, that drives some of our rural uh, economies, but also drives the management for a lot of these species uh, and why a lot of them have recovered to the point they have today is due to the funding of that conservation uh, through hunting. So mammalogy, uh, we're gonna cover a wide variety of topics that they focus on here. So some of them focus on, nat focus on natural history. Where did these species arise? How long have they been there? What function do they play in the system? In seed dispersal, pollination, uh, controlling other species, um, all those sorts of things, Tax taxonomy and systematics. So actually the classification of those species and where they fall within the family tree. Anatomy, just figuring out um, what is different in those mammals and their internal uh, internal composition that separates them from one another and specialize their existence on the landscape. Ethology, which is basically a fancy term for animal behavior. How do they react in different environments? So we know white-tailed deer occur throughout the United States, but how does their uh, how does how do they interact in a desert environment, in a forested environment, in the savanna, in the grassland, on a barrier island, on top, etc. Um, and so those behaviors are important because those can drive some of those same things that we see in their natural history, their environment, live within their environment, and interact with other species in that environment. Ecology overall, a lot of the same things we talked about behavior there and many others. A lot of those overlap uh, with general focus, but there are whole journals covered to uh, mammalogy, sometimes to certain species uh, of mammals and so on that, that basically are based around these same things. So what is a mammalogy? So <laughs> mammalogy is a study of the animals that constitute the class mammalia within the kingdom animalia. So when we talk about class and kingdom, what is that? And what it is, is when we basically, when we talk about scientific classification, we start at the largest uh, um, thing that something would fall into. So in this case, animalia, and that is the kingdom. And then basically it breaks down. So phylum chordata, that means it's chordate. It has a dorsal notochord, which is the beginnings or, or you know, part of your, um, uh, oh goodness, your back, your spinal column, your spinal cord. Uh, that goes from your brain and innervates your body. The class mammalia, meaning it displays the classic signs of mammals, which we'll talk about here soon. Order rodentia, which is rodents, family, heteromyidae, genus, diplodomies, and species compactus. So in this case, it's a kangaroo rat, and he's part of a scientific study, so he's got a little metal ear clip in there that designates what number he is in his existence. But basically, the way to remember those as you go down is most people remember genus and species because you've ever watched Wiley e. Coyote and the Roadrunner. As they freeze framed, you would see the little genus and species pop up right there. So we were indoctrinated with it from a young age, even before we started studying anything uh, of what a genus and species were. Basically, it's the lowest two classifications that gets you to the most specific of what that species is. But the way the mnemonic that we would remember that by, sorry, my dogs are barking at the uh, construction workers working on the sidewalk outside. If y'all can hear that, <laughs> it's really loud in my office. But uh, King Philip came over from Germany singing. So kingdom, king, phylum, Philip came over from Germany singing. K-P-C-O-F-G-S. And so starting at the largest and most inclusive all the way down to uh, the most specific at the species level, King Philip came over from Germany singing. It's a good way to remember that. So what is a mammal? Uh, mammals share a number of common features and not all of these occur uh, as some of you all probably know, uh, but basically hair and fur, some of us have more hair than others, uh, especially in the human race, but uh, generally that hair focuses on aiding in internal temperature control. So you'll have under hair, guard hairs, uh, thick fur, more diffuse fur, and you even see some species, like if you look at a white-tailed deer right now in our landscape, they generally have more of a red or orangish hue to them because they have a summer coat that usually is more diffuse, has longer, uh, longer, thinner hairs. And as they grow, go into their winter coat, uh, that's usually grayer, firmer, thicker, denser to insulate them 
Um, even our dogs, you know, if you've got a lab, uh, if you've got some of the fuzzier breeds like a collie or a husky, you know those guys shed like crazy between the seasons. And so that's just naturally uh, them adapting their bodies to the systems that they would have evolved in. Uh, number two is mammary glands for the nourishment of young. So modified sweat glands, but produce milk um, to feed the young and nourish them as they get started before they can eat solid foods or seek out their own food. Uh, so mammary glands are a very important life-giving source and a distinguishing characteristic for mammals. Most all of them give birth to live young. So those come in the form of a placenta uh, dependent embryo that develops in a uterus and is then given birth to, and at the time of birth is uh, self-aware, cognizant, and so on. There is no egg laying outside of the body and then incubation period for, with very few exceptions for those that are uh, determined to be mammals. Others, uh, generally most mammals have teeth of some type. There's various differentiations of those teeth, uh, depending on what they eat, how they eat, uh, and how long the species has been around. And then almost all have a four chambered heart, just like we do atrium ventricles in and out, pump through the heart, to the lungs, out to the body, et cetera. Of these in Texas, there are 97 genera or genuses and 181 species of mammals. So obviously we're not gonna go over all 181 species that could occur in the state today, but we're gonna try to cover quite a few. So groups, monotremes, these are the rare exceptions that do not give birth to live young, they lay eggs. Some of y'all may very quickly think of a platypus. So very unique creature down, down in Australia, um, but definitely an exception to the gives birth to live young rule. The other one is marsupials. So most of our marsupials occur in Australia and South America, but we do have one that occurs in North America, which a lot of y'all probably know, Virginia opossums or possums uh, have a pouch. But basically they give birth to a very small uh, live young. That live young climbs from the birth canal up through the fur into the pouch. And usually there's a nipple in there that they latch onto and they finish development on that nipple and stay in that pouch. You know, anybody think about a wallaby or a kangaroo and the little Joey popping his head out of there in mama's pouch uh, can think of more of those marsupials. Uh, and then placental mammals, which what are humans, dogs, cats, cows, you know, some of the things we're more familiar with, and of course, raccoons, white-tailed deer, uh, bobcats, and so on, all placental mammals, um, where once the egg is fertilized inside the uterus, it's attached via placenta to the uterine wall and develops until the time it is born. So there are some of your marsupials, of course, us. So when we talk about marsupials and things that occur here, so we talk about didelphomorphia, uh, didelpha day, Virginia opossum, the one marsupial that occurs in Texas. This is a pretty easy one. I'm sure all of y'all have seen these, either if you live in town, climbing along your back fence, along your privacy fence, somewhere around your trash, along any creek or stream, if you go out at night, you will probably see these at some point walking around. Um, Fairly easy to ID for a lot of folks. They have a scaly looking tail. It's prehensile, meaning that it can bend and is actually functional. If you see that one hanging up there from the top from that tree branch, uh, they have five toes on each foot. A big toe on the hind foot is opposable. It sticks out pretty far, which is pretty handy for hanging on to tree branches and vines and things such as that. And this diet is highly omnivorous. Uh, they'll eat anything from dead animals to insects to fruit. Uh, they're an occasional nest predator, uh, but not a specific one. Basically, if they can eat it, they'll put their mouth around it and see if it'll go down. Um, pretty variable in their habitats, but generally going to be around water for the most part, um, or at least some water source will be nearby. As we get drier, uh, as you go further into West Texas, you don't really find them in the uplands. You're more, more or less going to be along streams and creeks. As you come further east of I-35, where water is fairly well distributed with ponds, homes, water troughs, creeks and streams. Uh, they're pretty much across the landscape. Uh, but it's the only marsupial north of Mexico. And so we were talking about those collections earlier. Every black dot is where there is a verified 
uh, is a verified sample collected and is in a repository somewhere. That's where the black dots are. And the gray out, grayed out shading is where those species are known to occur. So if you look out here in West Texas, that little shaded line is basically showing along the Rio Grande and maybe some of the tributaries that come up and out of there. But as you get into the high desert grasslands and these interior mountain ranges, it's not really known to exist in those areas. So you get the Pecos River, so there's some there, uh, Rio Grande, and of course East Texas is just ubiquitous um, across the landscape there. So, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the next species we're going to talk about is the nine banded armadillo. So these do occur in the natural landscape. They're not just always found dead on the side of the road with their belly upturned, uh, but they have very interesting biology. Um, most folks don't realize this because they think of, of armadillos as being quintessentially Texan, but up until about the 1850s or 1860s, they were fairly unknown to occur in the state. They have essentially migrated north since then as documented through collections and through, uh, through uh, observations from scientists. But up, like I said, up through the mid 1800s, they had not been collected or documented by virtually anyone. They moved north out of Mexico. There's actually a number of other armadillo species that occur in Central and South America, all the way down to the very tip. Uh, and there some of them are in steep decline because they're actually a popular food source. Some of them are almost three to four times the size of the nine banded armadillo uh, and can produce a fair amount of meat, uh, no less. But anyways, they have very simplistic teeth. If you ever have seen a skull of an armadillo, which if we were in person, I would have been able to bring one. Uh, but they have just little peg like teeth and what those are used for primarily for eating invertebrates. So a lot of times you'll see them digging digging through, um, digging into loose sandy vegetation, making a tunnel uh, to hide in or digging down and looking, you see these little triangular shaped holes where they're digging down and what they're looking for is either uh, looking for um, grubs, beetle larvae uh, of various types, uh, really just anything that they can eat that's soft, chewable, and those peg-like teeth can make short work of. Uh, but they have a bony carapace, and so that's that shell covering uh, over the top. And uh, and uh, those burrows are really dependent on those sandy soil conditions where they're able to dig easily. If you're in the blacklands, it's a little harder in the middle of summer to dig into the blacklands than it is into a sandy soils. You know, it can get hard as concrete once that stuff starts cracking. Um, mostly insects and some eggs, but there are 10 genuses and 20 species of armadillo in total. Uh, but as I've seen in some of the, the comments that are popping up, yes, armadillos have expanded very far north into the central U.S. and all the way over east into the eastern seaboard uh, in Florida and even parts of southern Georgia. Um, most of their distribution is going to be affected by um, how cold it gets. So when we have a large long-term freeze event like we just had across most of the central U.S., that probably killed a lot of armadillos up north because they are Central and South American species primarily. Um, they will not have evolved the ability to hibernate for long periods of time or find food when it's not available for long periods of time. They're usually found in more uh, subtropical climates. And so you may see them expand during warm periods and then retract when you have some of these 30, 40 year weather events. Uh, that could really reduce their abundance or even end it if they're in small isolated uh, populations. So very little hair on these guys um, and water. They're known to do, they can swim, uh, but they've also been known to walk underwater uh, along uh, the bottom as well uh, because they tire pretty easily. Those short little arms is pretty tough to doggy paddle. Um, <clears throat> they can take in that air, trap air underneath their shell to swim. Uh, but they've been able to cross all the major rivers in Texas with little problem as they've done their expansion. And uh, some of those can be pretty large during their flood stages. The other really interesting thing about armadillos is they give birth to identical quadruplets. Uh, so always four, uh, you know, as long as they're all healthy and always all the same sex uh, generally. Uh, but the younger born with their eyes open and walking within a few hours. And that's what we call precocial young versus altricial young. So Precocial, if you think about a precocious child, precocial means um, they're generally 
capable of supporting themselves to some degree the moment they are born. So if you think about some songbirds, say like a killdeer, uh, as soon as they're born, they are up and walking and moving around. Uh, if you think about things like a horse or a calf, within a few hours of being born, they're up and walking around. Versus altricial, if you think about things like um, rabbits, puppies, humans, well, we're born and we need to be taken care of for a while. Uh, for some of those other species, it's only a few weeks. For us, you know, it's generally four or four or five years old. Um, probably not very good at pre preparing your own food, providing your own food to, at any reasonable level. Um, and once they get to about four, they can go raid the pantry themselves and grab the Ritz crackers or the Pop Tarts or or whatever else. Um, <clears throat> but that's the difference between precocial and altricial. So. Moving on from there, now we're going to get into some of the, the smaller folks that a lot of a lot of y'all may or may not have ever seen. So Sorsicomorpha, so Sorcerer Co. Uh, if you look at the family next, Sorcerer Day, those are the shrews. And so shrews are small mammals that are rat or mouse-like, but are very uh, primitive uh, and generally insectivorous that live almost always, they may live in trees to a small degree and be uh, and, um, arboreal, but for the most part live in leaf litter, uh, ground litter, grass litter, and uh, live along the ground. And we'll go over some of those species here. So shrews versus moles. So these are the most primitive placental mammals. The fossil record shows that they go back 170 million years. If you remember, the dinosaurs only went extinct about 65 million years ago. And so they lived about 100 million years with uh, dinosaurs. So uh, some of those species were, you know, <clears throat> neighbors with T-Rex there for a while. But shrews and moles are not strictly insectivorous, but mostly so. Moles are what we call fossorial, which means they live in the soil. They don't live above ground. And most North American shrews live above ground. They don't live in the soil. Uh, their burrows are only used for sleeping and not for um, searching for prey, breeding, and everything else like it is for moles. So Texas only has one mole species known and four shrews. And overall, there are 39 species of shrews in the U.S. So we talk about the eastern mole. If you could look at those big paddle-shaped feet. If you live in a sandier soil, <coughs> excuse me, you may have seen those mole trails through the yard or out in the pastures where it's a consistent, steady, raised lump of loose soil um, moving through the, the soil profile, eating vegetation, eating earthworms, eating beetle larvae that, that they find as they move through. So they're generally anywhere from 110 to 170 millimeters. So the, for those for those, for those of y'all who aren't as familiar with the metric system, divide that by 10, you get centimeters. So that'd be 11 to 17 centimeters. It's two and a half, 2.54 centimeters per inch. So roughly you're looking at four to nine inches is kind of what you're looking at from a, from a uh, size perspective on a mole. But it's got front broad feet, paddle shaped. Their eyes are essentially non-functional since they live in that dark environment. They're much reduced in size. They're short and a very sparsely haired tail. So think of a possum tail. And that's kind of what a mole tail looks like, and just real scaly, not a whole lot on it. They're primarily eating earthworms, uh, but they also eat, like I said, insects and their larvae, some vegetation. But the neat thing about moles and shrews is what we all like to do is they're able to eat about 25 to 100 percent of their own weight in food a day in order to subsist and uh, live. So a quarter to 100 percent of its own weight as it moves through the soil profile. So there has to be it has to be a uh, a high uh, target environment, you know, uh, in order for them to subsist over a long period of time uh, in order to be there. The soil has to be healthy and support a large variety of, of insect life in order for them to be there. Uh, but as, it's, as, it's, as you would expect for a burrowing animal, they're restricted in distribution by soil. So they have shallow burrows for feeding uh, and deep ones for raising young. So if you look at their distribution there on the map, you're primarily seeing it in areas with looser soils, or at least pockets of loose soil, and they're not as common in areas with either lots of rock outcropping, drier soils that can, can get concretions that become difficult to move through. 
It's generally east of a rainfall belt of 25 inches or in some of the deep uh, loamy and dune type soils up in the high Texas plains. So shrews, generally, even though they have a very small body size, they have a very high metabolic rate and spend much of their time actively foraging. Uh, a few species have poisonous salivary secretions to subdue their prey. So they generally are, are doing most of their movements at night. They're nocturnal uh, and mostly terrestrial and in generally moist habitats. So you're not going to expect them in full sun grasslands very often to be active during the middle of the day. They're going to be out at night uh, or on the margins of creeks, streams, uh, hillside seeps and things such as that. Um, their front feet are, you know, uh, proportional to their body. They're not paddle shaped like the moles. And their eyes are small, but they're still functional, uh, unlike the shrew, whose eyes aren't very functional at all. And so to give you an idea of just how high their metabolic rate is, and some of the sampling we did in college when we were looking for small mammals, we use Sherman live traps, these little square prisms, uh, and throw some olive oil and, or cooking oil of some type, oats and bird seed in there, and that would attract most of our rats and mice. And we'd be able to catch them, measure them, figure out what was in that landscape, both in the in the woods and out in uh, savannas and grasslands. But shrews weren't attracted to that seed. So the only way to catch them was to put in what we call drop buckets. And basically those drop buckets are, we dug a hole, put in a five gallon bucket, uh, and anything that happened to be crawling along through that leaf litter would fall in. And so you'd get spiders, beetles, uh, caterpillars, all kinds of things falling in there, uh, various insects that couldn't crawl out. And occasionally a shrew would fall in. And if a shrew fell into that bucket, woe to the insects that were still in there. Because we would show up and some of the other buckets might have 10, 15, 30, 40 different insects in there and uh, spiders and scorpions and things like that. If you get to the shrews bucket, there might be one or two survivors, but everybody else was eaten. Uh, eaten and gone, you might find leg parts or thorax here and there, but that shrew was going to town on the buffet that was in there. Um, and if we went there and we waited too long to, uh, before the next morning and enough insects hadn't fall in, fallen in, sometimes those shrews would actually be dead uh, by the next morning. Their metabolism was so fast that they may actually starve in that single night uh, because there wasn't enough insects in there. So <clears throat> when we look at uh, the first species we're going to talk about here that's primarily a west, western Texas species, the desert shrew, this is one that's primarily found in arid regions and does not make use of underground burrows. But again, large quantities of invertebrates, worms, spiders, insects, um, they can kill lizards and birds, but they're not actively seeking them out. It's more opportunistic. Uh, and so mostly it's going to be on those insect larvae and adult insects. And they eat about 75% of their body weight each day of those species. Uh, and this is one of the few species that can subsist without drinking water. So they get most of their liquid from the species they are eating from metabolic water as they break it down. Pretty neat little... Uh, adaptation for living in an arid environment. Uh, <clears throat> least shrew inhabits grasslands and fields, and they generally, they'll sometimes they'll even use the runways of cotton rats and thick vegetation to seek out some of these things. So again, also mainly insects, bugs, and earthworms, snails, slugs. Um, they, for whatever reason, somebody went deep enough to know that they will open up the insides of grasshoppers and crickets and just eat the internal organs and leave the rest. Uh, I guess they just want the good bits <laughs> when times are good. Uh, and they can be in higher densities and are considered more sociable in contrast to other shrews, which uh, some of the other shrews are known to, if they come across a smaller shrew, just eat it too, because they got to eat. So uh, they can be pretty unfriendly to one another, and that can be a bad, bad deal when it's breeding season if you're a small little shrew out there looking for a mate. So short-tailed shrews, uh, forested areas, associated meadows. Uh, these guys are the ones who produce some so, uh, some so, uh, so poison, and it leaks down uh, from their saliva from a submaxillary gland. So your maxilla is basically the roof of your mouth, so it's kind of the back of the mouth, and it produces that poison and runs forward. Uh, they're primarily found just in the East Texas piney woods and a little bit in the post oak savanna. Um, in the eastern third of the state, and they're one of the ones that are really tied to moist soils. So these are the ones that, when I was doing that stuff, that mammal collection in East Texas, 
uh, these were the ones we were typically catching. So getting away from the shrews, and now we're in order Chiroptera. This is the, these are the bats. And so they're generally broken down into four different families. And we'll talk about the differences in these families. Uh, but Mormupidae, Phylostomidae, Molossidae, and Vespertilianidae, which is just kind of fun to say. Uh, isn't that rhyme too? But anyways, uh, those are the four families of bats that occur in the state. Uh, bats are ubiquitous across the world. Uh, they're very diverse, and they're the only mammals capable of true flight. So we have other mammals that have adaptations for gliding from tree to tree. Uh, we think about flying squirrels and things such as that. But bats are the only ones who are able to generate enough force to produce lift to actually lift themselves to fly around rather than just gliding from one location to the next. And they make up about one fifth of mammalian species worldwide. Uh, with that, we have 32 species that have been known to occur in Texas. Some are just incidental and some spend just summers here and some spend the whole year here. But for their diet, it's highly variable. Some focus on fish, some are frugivores, which are uh, fruit eaters. And that is a typo. It should say insectivores, not incestivores. So <laughs> uh, and some are sang sanguivores, which it means they, they eat blood. Have you ever heard of vampire bats? Um, but they can be important pollinators for certain species, and we'll talk about that. So the largest bat known to exist is in the southern hemisphere uh, in Australia and in Indonesia, uh, and that area over there is a flying fox with a wingspan of up to 5 feet 7 inches. So I'm 5'9", um, so that bat's wingspan is almost the width of the average adult American male whose height is right now, I think, around 5'10". So three inches short of the height of the average adult American male. So my boss's brother lives in Australia, and some of these flying foxes will roost in the eaves of their house on the soffit underneath that has the holes. They'll throw their toes in there. Uh, and so you'll go out in the morning and look over, and there's a two and a half foot long bat with a five foot, five and a half foot wingspan just hanging from the side of your house. <laughs> he said it took him a little while to get used to after growing up in Austin uh, to have these giant bats hanging off the house. But uh, it's a pretty, pretty impressive species when you see them. So the Mormupid bats, these are the family Mormupidae. These are, are neotropical, basically meaning they're in the North American tropics and points north. Small to medium size, uh, and and they and the other thing being, being neotropical is they occur in the subtropics or the temperate zones during the summer, and they go back to the temp to the tropical zones during the winter. So these would be mostly migratory. So they're highly insectivorous, generally live near water and in very large colonies. So one of these is the ghost face bat. See that face only mama could love there uh, in the Rio Grande Valley and east to about San Antonio. Uh, concave face with a leaf like chin. Nothing else really looks like that um, from the face alone. So you see that distribution basically along the Rio Grande, just barely coming into Texas and not very common in the US in general. Um, Basically, the only real member in that more movement day family that we'll talk about, um, if you start going into Phylostomidae or the leaf nose bats, these are in the, only in the southwestern U.S. Uh, associated with some more cactus species, all the way down into Argentina and into the West Indian Islands and the Caribbean. So very small, all the way to extremely large, and we'll talk about some of that here in a second. But these can be uh, <clears throat> meat eaters, insect eaters, and and fruit eaters. Their habitats they are in are very diverse, their roost preference is very diverse, and their diets are diverse. So a lot of these are looped in. But one of the most important ones, particularly if you like uh, tequila, is the Mexican long nose bat. These are one of those uh, very important pollinator species, and they fly around in these desert uh, environments and scrublands. And agaves and then the flowering species within those woodlands are dependent on this Mexican long nose bat that has an extended rostrum that houses a very long tongue that allows it to distribute pollen along its fuzzy face um, to all these different species. And so if you like to drink tequila, you need to thank the Mexican long nose bat for fertilizing those flowers, allowing it to produce food to produce more agaves. So <clears throat> nectar, pollen of flowers are on sensory plant. They generally have drab brown plumage, uh, pelage, not plumage, associated with silver white tipped hairs. 
They've been endangered in Texas since 1988, since we're on the very edge of the range for the species that it typically is going to be associated with. The hairy leg vampire bat has been known to occur in, if you think about where Big Bend is, there's one on the very northeast tip of the Big Bend area. Uh, and there's only been one specimen collected. So vampire bats are not really known to occur in Texas with any regularity. And so it may have just been an accidental visitor. You know, it showed up and was like, not really a normal distribution or a mistake in the collection is that some of these collectors collected in both the US and Mexico and they may have mislabeled where they collected it. Um, not really known. It's an older sample, but it does occur in Mexico. It does um, can inflict wounds on cattle, usually not deadly wounds, but ones that bleed where it can lick up the blood. <clears throat> Other members of the different family Molossidae. Uh, these are generally only in the warm regions, but are found worldwide, small to moderately large, generally insectivorous, and forest to deserts, and from solitary to immense colonies. Four of these species in this family are found in Texas. So one of the ones we're most familiar with are the free-tailed bats. Um, and because of their long, narrow wings, they have to attain speed to develop enough lift to fly. And so they accomplish this by falling some distance from the roofs or takeoff point before lifting up. So you think about somebody who's doing paragliding or something like that, they'll run off of a cliff, jump, and then they lift it by the wind and go in the same way. That's why these guys like to hang off of bridges, uh, bridges, caves, uh, overpasses, all these sorts of things. They hang from the ceiling, drop down that eight to 20 feet lift up out of the cave and they're into flight. They generate enough speed to get themselves started and go. Once they're on the ground, generally they'll try to climb up something so they could drop down and go again, rather than just taking off. It's very difficult for them to take off from the ground. So the, probably the most abundant and well-known species that we have in the state, the Mexican or Brazilian pre-tailed bat. Um, they occur across the entire state, migratory, you know, populations in the millions in some of their locations. Uh, if you think of the Congress Street Bridge in Austin, um, oh goodness, I can't think of the place in Houston right now off the top of my head. It's also a bridge where a lot of merge. Uh, Bracken Cave down near San Antonio. Some of the large emergences you see across the cave systems in the hill country of, of Texas are pr primarily Mexican slash Brazilian retail bats. And so <clears throat> one of the easiest ways to tell them is when you look at that, um, when you look at that, that in general is that tail hangs freely uh, about a third of the length of it from that Europatasium, that skin flap that goes from the legs to the tail, about a third of that tail hangs free. So they call it free tail. And they tend to roost with some other species as well. And their ears are not joined at the midline. So <clears throat> the last one in the wall cover most extensively is the family Vespertilianidae. And so Again, worldwide distribution, insectivorous, very diverse, largest family with over 300 species, and 25 of these species out of the 30 known to occur in the U.S. occur in Texas. And so, myotis is a derivative of the Greek word for mouse ears. You can see those little ears that they have on there. Those are nine different species in that genus. And southeastern myotis here is primarily a forested species. I had a friend looking for southeastern myotis and raffinus, big-eared bats across East Texas, and they were primarily bottomland hardwood forest specific. Uh, and some of you may know that we've flooded about 40 to 50%, either we've lost about 75% of our bottomland hardwood forest in East Texas. Either they've been cut over uh, in the past for timber production. Uh, they've been cut over for pasture uh, uh, creation for grazing animals, or they've been flooded. If you think about Sam Rayburn Reservoir or Toledo Bend Reservoir, uh, on the Sabine Rivers and the Natchez and Angelina Rivers, just those two reservoirs in the state eliminated about 340,000 acres of bottomland hardwood forest when they flooded. Uh, so that's larger than Brazos County where I live. Um, there's major reservoirs in almost all of our, our East Texas rivers. Um, and so Southeastern Myotis is one of those that occur in there. So she would go around in these bottomland hardwood forests, basically shoving her head in hollow trees or, or cameras in areas that where the holes were too small to shove her head in, looking for roost sites for these bats. Uh, another myotis species is a cave myotis, so central and south Texas, all the way up to the Transpecus Rolling Plains. 
Uh, this is the largest myotis, and they generally emerge later and forage lower than some of the other species that are, are that are out there. Almost all insects. So you see that kind of split distribution in the hill country of Texas, and then in the rolling plains, and into Oklahoma. Uh, <clears throat> the silver-haired bat. Um, this one tree cavities, loose bark, uh, and its distribution is generally statewide it, assumed, but there's not a lot known about it as it, it, it kind of shows up in very small colonies or even in singles. And so just a few places with, uh, with known collections all the way from the big thicket and down to Galveston County, and then out into the central uh, hill country, the high plains, and then even far west Texas. So wide distribution, never super abundant. Uh, pipistrels, these are sporadic flyers. Some folks think they're they're confused for moss because they're so small a lot of times. But the western pipistrel or canyon bat and the eastern pipistrel are basically split up by where they occur. So the western pipistrel there, basically in the western hill country. Eastern pipistrel is usually redder in color uh, than the other one and is primarily in the northern and eastern half of uh, the state. Big brown bat. It's a big brown bat. Name pretty much discovers that uh, description. Kind of found throughout a little bit of a break there in the hill country, uh, but mainly in the eastern and western populations, mainly along forests or areas where they can find uh, riparian corridors, river corridors where trees are large enough to support them. Eastern red bats. They are generally find found in forests where they are found. They'll actually nest and roost in the ends of branches and clumps of dead leaves, and that's where you'll find them. So found throughout the state. Uh, the hoary bat up here on the top, it's a white black color. <clears throat> and it's one of the most widespread across the US except for Alaska. And then in very far south Texas, southern yellow bat, it actually nests in palm trees. So when you think about palm trees that have the hanging down dead palm fronds, they'll actually roost in those structures. Um, so when people come through and uh, manipulate those and trim them back for um, for appearances, it reduced some of those those nesting structures. And then there were about thirty thousand acres of sable palm forest uh, is the thought twenty to thirty thousand acres in the very far southern reaches of Texas. The only ones that still exist in a semi natural state occur in the very deep part of South Texas, and there's only about three hundred acres left of that. So um, the southern yellow bat does not did never had a large distribution in the U.S. and Texas, anyways. Um, but that distribution has basically been re reduced by about ninety to ninety five percent due to the loss of those sable palm trees that were native to that area. Lastly, the evening bat. So again, insectivore, another little guy, southeastern two thirds of Texas. And then the spotted bat. This is a primarily a West Texas and uh, uh, arid region species. Um, it's not really common anywhere within its range, and the only place it's been documented has been in Big Bend National Park. So another one that just barely comes into Texas. Big-eared bats. <clears throat> this is that Raffinesque big-eared bat, happily named. Sometimes those ears are half the length of its body. Uh, very good for locating insect prey in dense forest environments when they're echolocating. Uh, considered threatened due to loss of those bottomland hardwood forests in Texas, but really only that eastern sixth of the state is where they were found. And further west, you have the Townsend's big, bigger bat, and they're found more in uh, mountains, uh, mountains and forests and grasslands in the western parts of the state, primarily western hill country and high plains. And I don't know if y'all saw that part there that I didn't uh, didn't say, but. They can, when cold weather, they'll actually roll those ears up. And so another common name for them is ram-eared bat because it looks like a curled ram horn when they roll those things down. So kind of interesting adaptation to be in maybe a cooler environments. <clears throat> Pallid bats, another description. These are among the most abundant bats in Western Texas, uh, generally anywhere from a dozen to a hundred bats in the colony, but uh, very common in their distribution and everything else. So there's one singing the songs for the sound, singing the song of its people right there that's getting held. <laughs> so how do they catch these guys? Well, here they're putting up mist nets over a water source. 
Uh, if you've ever been into hill country uh, at dusk, you'll see large numbers of bats coming to get water or collect or even hunt and gather insects that are hatching from those water sources or around those water sources. And uh, they just put them over those, collect them in those mist nets, that's fine. And then, of course, wear their gloves and have their rabies shots and they can uh, document what species are occurring there, the abundance, uh, age classes, um, their weights, determine if they're healthy or not, and so on. That's the way that most folks collect them. So when we talk about echolocation, as we know, bats can use echolocation to locate prey items and navigate as they're going through areas. Uh, but they emit calls out to the environment and listen for the echoes of those calls. And the the length of time it takes for that ranging to be completed is how far away things are. And then how it hits back to the right ear or the left ear can tell you, <coughs> excuse me, is it closer on my right side or my left side? Um, where is it in relation to my body position, et cetera? Uh, so the only mammals known to echolocate are bats, various toothed whales like dolphins, killer whales, and sperm whales, um, and then some shrews. We talked about the northern short-tailed shrew earlier. They're known to echolocate as well. So one of the things when we talk about mammals is we don't always get to see them. Sometimes we just find their remains and we're finally done with bats. So there will be no test over all those different species. But as you can tell, lots of bats occur here. Um, so one of the things we use to identify skulls is dental formula. So a dental formula is developed to summarize the dentition and dental patterns in animals. So I equals incisors, C equals canines, P equals premolars, M equals molars. You count from the front, so from your front teeth to the back, even if they're not present. So that can occur in some humans, but in some animals, uh, take white-tailed deer, for example, on the jaw, it has six incisors on the front bottom, but on top, there's only a hardened pad. There are no teeth on the top of a white-tailed deer, on the top of its mouth. So <clears throat> if you were doing the dental formula for top and bottom, on top it would be zero for the incisors. And others have what we call a diastema, which is a gap between the incisors and the premolars and molars. And so there are no canine teeth. And so one of the things, anybody who's ever been elk hunting, one of the things a lot of folks will save uh, as a memento, and we even get turned into uh, jewelry and things from an elk, is elk still have vestigial canines. And so they sit there in the top of their mouth and they're not actually very much exposed at all but it's true ivory, and so folks will get those ground down into earrings, rings, some folks wear them as a necklace. Um, it was one of the things that Native Americans would use as well um, uh, as a form of jewelry uh, that they found, uh, but uh, just different things like that that you try to count through that are, are can be unique to the species you're looking at and identifiable characteristics to at least get you to a family, order, or a genus uh, based on teeth alone when you find a skull even a broken skull and just, a, I don't know if anybody's ever been out and just found a jawbone, but uh, in my experience I have, and I've been able to identify the species just by having a jawbone. Uh, and sometimes you'll find, you know, I've found deer fawn jaws out there that may be the size at the time of their death of something like a coyote or a, uh, a raccoon, but because of the dentition, I'm able to determine that it's a white-tailed deer and not one of those other species. Uh, for the total teeth, you multiply by two. So if you're looking at the coyote here, so he's got three incisors, I1, 2, 3, K9, premolar 1, 2, 3, premolar 4, which is a carnassial premolar, and then molar 1 and 2. And so for the bottom, it's incisor 1 through 3, K9, premolar 1 through 4, molar 1, carnassial pair, molar 2, 3. And so when you add those up, top and bottom is 3, 3, K9 is 1 and 1, premolars is 4 and 4 for top and bottom. Molar two on top slash three on bottom. Uh, and then the total teeth, when you add all that up, is 42. So coyotes have 42 teeth in their mouth in total. And so what can I tell about this by just looking at it? Well, he's got canine, or excuse me, incisors, which can be used for making initial bites. He's got larger canines, which can be used to hold on to some items or inflict damage. 
He's got multiple pre molars, which can be used for slicing and mashing things together. But he also has molars, which means that it's probably not restricted to just eating meat because most of the time, large developed molars are associated with eating plant material. And as we know, coyotes, if you've ever seen coyote scat, coyote turds laying out on the road, you'll see hair in them. They're pretty much eating whatever's most available at the time of year. You'll see some full of grasshopper legs this time of year and thoraxes. You'll see some that are full of cicadas this time of year as they emerge. You'll see others that are full of dewberries, persimmons, all those different things uh, reflecting their diet. And so they have to have multiple different types of teeth like we do as they have sort of an omnivorous diet. So when we look at this, now we're gonna go into a real mind blur compared just like the bats were, but rodents. And so I know this is a lot and it's a lot of species, but it's just the way this presentation is. There's a lot of species in the state. So I'm gonna start blowing through this a little faster. <clears throat> I know I'm already speaking pretty fast, but uh, so characteristics of rodents, incisors, generally they're stained brown a lot of times, continuously growing. So that's why you see that gnawing habit, why they're, why they're gnawing on your live oak trees in your backyard. I had some squirrels kill a couple of limbs two years ago when it was dry because they were oak tree limbs and girdling them, trying to get to that moisture when I was gone on vacation and didn't put out water like I usually do for the birds. Uh, and if they don't, their teeth, you've probably seen damage from these species uh, where they may have damaged the tooth and you'll see sometimes it'll, or their jaw and their incisors will actually grow through their lips because uh, they can't gnaw it down anymore. Rodents make up about 40% of all mammals. So we talked earlier about bats that were 20% of all mammals and now rodents make up the other 40%. So two thirds of these species uh, of mammals in the world are either rodents or bats. So we do not make up a very large percentage of, of what's out there. Uh, in the fossil record, they've been around about 66 million years, right around the extinction of non-avian dinosaurs. Very important economic-wise for humans uh, relative to the amount of damage they can do to various crops, to electrical outlets, um, things such as that. Uh, large numbers of the rodents, uh, you know, if you think about beavers and things like that, we talked about furs. Uh, that occur with them. Some people keep them as pets. Uh, when we talk about different species, <clears throat> not just rats, but others as well. Uh, medical, they're very important for scientific research. Some places are important for food. Uh, they've even trained rats to sniff out landmines in certain areas. Um, so they've been around for a long time. So if we think about the family Sciuridae, these are squirrels and their allies. And there's basically three basic body forms from squirrels. You have tree squirrels, brown squirrels, and flying squirrels. So those tree squirrels are the ones that we usually see in our yards with the long, bushy tails, sharp claws, and for a squirrel, fairly large ears that bounce around, eat uh, all your bird seed, uh, hang upside down, destroy your bird feeder if it's not created well, uh, and are the ones we're most familiar with in this part of the state. There's flying squirrels, which have a furred membrane between their top and bottom legs called the patagium that allows them from, to jump and control themselves in the air as they glide from tree to tree. Those occur mainly in the eastern part portions of the state. And then we have ground squirrels. And so ground squirrels are mainly found in rockier or less treed areas of the state. You'll see these a lot in the Western Hill Country and in desert landscapes. These are generally thicker, more robust looking squirrels with short sturdy forelimbs four that allow them to burrow and dig into those environments to have somewhere to hide. Um, and but they occur throughout the world, uh, except for Australia and South America and some desert regions. And they're known to cache their food. So you think about squirrels gathering nuts for the winter, burying nuts, they'll go back and find them later. They can be very important seed dispersers in, in certain landscapes. So we do have one species of chipmunk that comes into Texas. We won't talk long about it, but gray-footed chipmunk comes into some of the western montane areas out there in the Guadalupe Mountains and Trans-Pecos, where you get into some of those Ponderosa pine forests and elevations above 5,500, 6,000 feet. Um, you can't find them out there, but it's the only real spot they kind of trickle into the state. Uh, other ones, <clears throat> this little Texas antelope squirrel, sparsely vegetated areas, uh, usually around shrubby areas, rocky areas, and near mountain ranges again, only pretty much around the Pecos River and point, points west. Don't really see it east of the Devils. Don't really see it north of Midland, Odessa, or I-20. So the Mexican ground squirrel, we have a number of these ground squirrel species, 
Most of them have pretty, pretty omnivorous diet, diets. They'll basically eat whatever they can get their mouths around. They'll find bird nests, insects, other mice, uh, lots of seeds, nuts, roots, shrubs, uh, flowers. Basically, southwestern <clears throat> Texas up into the rolling plains, fairly wide distribution, fairly common where they're found. Uh, a lot of these other species look similar. They'll be different in where they're found. Uh, maybe they'd be a sandy land specialist like this one. It's only found in sandy environments with sparse vegetation. It's usually a little smaller than the Mexican ground squirrel um, and it's usually associated with other species. So here they're associated with kangaroo rats a lot of times. 13 lion ground squirrel. This one is known to be quite abundant in human landscapes. So here you can see from the high plains all the way down to kind of black land prairie, post oak savanna. All the way down to the coast. So this is one that we find in our areas. There's, see, there's Bell County, Eastern Bell County. Basically, if you're in the Blacklands, it could still occur there, but probably not in the hill country. Uh, rock squirrel. This one looks like a tree squirrel on steroids. He's still got the long bushy tail, still has the large ears, but he's generally got a darker coat. But look at those thick arms. You know, he's been hitting the weight room in there, so he can dig in. But these are the guys that I would chase out in Uvalde uh, in some in an old rock quarry. Uh, as a kid trying to catch them, never caught one, but <laughs> but uh, uh, fairly common where found and uh, uh, a pretty pretty robust looking ground squirrel out there. Um, other ones we may associate with certain landscapes. So black-tailed prairie dogs used to be hugely abundant. If you see the certified specimen maps, we we're talking about collections earlier and the importance of collections. There were collections made in Tarrant County. That's Fort Worth. So in the Fort Worth Prairie, in the Grand Prairie out here, there were prairie dogs. All the way down, there were collections made in Bear County, that's San Antonio. So all the way down into the Texas Hill Country, uh, they were found all the way down to there through the trans -Pecos. Um There are even some records of when the uh, XIT Ranch was, was built or made out here, the 3 million acres that were donated uh, for construction of the state capitol down in this area. When they were doing that survey, from up here near Dalhart, Dallam County, there was almost an unbroken line of prairie dog towns down to near San An present day San Angelo as they were doing some of that surveying. They estimated there may have been more than 20 million prairie dogs uh, in that prairie dog town as it spread, spread across that entire length of over 240 miles. So pretty incredible. They're, they're highly restricted now to certain areas. Um, their range has been reduced greatly, both from brush encroachment and also from targeting uh, from perceived uh, competition with grazing livestock. Eastern gray squirrel. So this, the way to tell this one from the fox squirrel we'll talk about here in the, section, the, the next slide is generally a gray coat with a white belly. It likes to live in continuous woodlands typically. You will find these in yards in Houston area, basically east of Bryan College Station into the Piney Woods. You can kind of see here's the distribution of that gray squirrel. The one we're more familiar with that goes all the way out into West Texas is the fox squirrel. He's got the orange belly and the orange coloration. And you'll find them kind of all over of deciduous and mixed forest and use their hollow trees as dens. But you'll see they'll go all the way up into the high plains along Rikarian corridor uh, and go from there. So I see a lot of these questions popping up in the chat, but because I'm presenting, they're only popping up as like four or five words. So I can, I'll probably be able to address some of these when I finish. I'm blowing through this. I've got about 20 minutes before, or 25 minutes before I'm gonna have to leave for this appointment and I apologize, but uh, we're gonna try to get through this and I'll try to get some of your questions before the end. So Eastern flying squirrel. So here you can see that Europatasia in between the legs, the jump to fly. It's the only gliding mammal that we have in Texas. Um, they live in holes and in stumps in East Texas, where they're managing for an endangered woodpecker species. It only lives in live pine trees, or one of the only woodpecker species to make holes in live pine trees. Uh, the red cockaded woodpecker, these are one of the primary guys that will <clears throat> uh, come out and uh, take over those burrows. So they have to compete with them because they like those, those woodpecker colonies and the holes they produce. So their distribution is kind of from Dallas down to Houston and points east in a more forested environment. So beavers. Not a whole lot to say about these guys. They can swim a long way. 
They create their own habitat. They can dam and all, and and the dam water offers protection. They're a keystone, keystone species. Their existence in the environment can increase habitat for various fish species, for waterfowl, wading birds. They can flood a bunch of timber and create dead trees, which, which creates habitat for woodpeckers, which creates holes for things like squirrels and other nesting birds. Just really important. Um, a kind of landscape engineer naturally that's out there and they can live in a variety of rivers, lakes, oxbows. They can do a lot of their work at night. Um, they, they've really expanded their range across Texas in the last 40 years. You'll basically find them in pretty much every major river and creek system now in the state where they occurred historically with few exceptions, particularly in West Texas. Um, but what a lot of folks don't know is, <clears throat> you know, uh, so I saw the question there, how is fur bearing defined? Fur bearing are generally those that produce a coat that's thick enough and of quality to be considered usable for either uh, clothing, protective wear, or uh, some other use. And so it can be different things, like sometimes boar's hair, even the hair of pigs used to be used for brushes and, and things like that or for protection. You know, I used to shoot a boar hair tab when I shot my bow because it was thick enough and coarse enough to withstand that, that tension. Um, so that's typically how fur bearing is defined. There's actually a legal definition uh, in the Texas Parks and Wildlife Outdoor Annual. If you want to look that up, the, the little pamphlet that we produce, or you can go online and look it up. It has a strict legal definition of what fur bearing is. And if you're collecting to sell, uh, make crafts or distribute, you have to have a, if you don't have a hunting license, you have to have a trapper's or a fur bearer's license in order to do those things uh, under Texas Parks and Wildlife Code. But one of the descriptions, we're doing some work out here in West Texas right now, trying to restore some riparian habitats from gallery forests along Terlingua Creek. Their descriptions from the early 1900s that it was a flowing stream with cottonwoods lining it where the cattle could walk in the shade for 60 miles from the confluence with the Rio Grande all the way up <clears throat> to about within 20, 25 miles of Alpine. And that was because the beavers had dammed that stream and created the water table had gotten high enough as a result of that to support um, large cottonwood trees. There's trees out there that are 60, 70 feet tall uh, in that desert environment because the water table's high enough uh, due to that flooding regime and that hydrology created by those beaver dams, pooling that water, allowing it to percolate in the soil and support those trees. And so as the beavers were killed and the trees were cut for gypsum uh, production to generate heat to break down the gypsum uh, they were trying to produce out there at the time, that system was destroyed and now there was no trees for the beavers to eat, so the beavers can't, couldn't come and there were no beavers to pool the water to support the water high water table that supported the trees. And so it's largely a treeless stream now, more pl prone to flash flooding. And so we're doing some work in Big Bend National Park and State Park and then with some private landowners to build that system back up, uh, locating areas with, uh, with naturally high water tables to reestablish trees building beaver dam analogs, which basically means putting natural material in the stream channel to uh, tighten that water table and increase more trees to get there. And then eventually the beavers should colonize from where they still exist on the Rio Grande uh, further north and restore that ecosystem. So porcupines, excellent climbers. Most folks are familiar with these guys. They're primarily in the western portion of the state. Uh, and they eat the cambium layer off of trees. So we used to see a lot down here in Uvalde when I was a kid. Uh, they'd like to go to corn feeders, hang out in live oak trees during the day. Um, you'll find them in those rocky areas out there. Uh, fairly unassuming. I've never gotten too close to one, so I don't know how aggressive they can be. So nutria is one that we now find in the state, but it's actually introduced. This was introduced as a fur bearer. They wanted them to replace the beaver that had been extirpated. Uh, and they can be pretty detrimental to aquatic vegetation in certain areas. But a lot of these in eastern Texas, Louisiana, mainly the eastern portions of the state, but pretty pretty ubiquitous. You'll find them in farm ponds, creeks, streams, uh, oxbow lakes, and so on. So here we're getting into the pocket gophers, fur-lined cheeks. There's nine different species in Texas. These are the ones that usually occur in pastures that you see people poisoning for. for. And so we talked earlier about some of the... Uh, some of the uh, different early Texas mammologists. So here is an <clears throat> Geomies at water eye. That's the pocket of the gopher that occurs down here near also, go figure where the water prairie chicken occurs. So some of our naturalists get some species named after them. 
but this is a delineation of each species based on its geographic location within the state. So, Joey Berserius, Knox Jones Eye, Arenarius, which Arenarius generally means sandy, Aaron, Arenosa, Texensis, Personatus, at Water Eye, and Breviceps for East Texas. And so they've got these fur lined cheeks <clears throat> and they're scattered throughout. Another species with fur lined cheeks are the pocket mice and the kangaroo rats. Some of these species are very well adapted to desert or dune beach environments and are usually strongly bipedal, meaning they usually use just their back legs. So deep south Texas, one of those species that barely creeps into Texas is Mexican spiny pocket mouse. There's from Fish and Wildlife Service, Doug, <clears throat> Doug's right there holding one that he captured down there in South Texas doing some of his work. Hispid pocket mouse with more of a statewide distribution. So the guy with the hispid black and brown coat. And then kangaroo rats, which a lot of folks are familiar with uh, from their long tails and bouncing large footed gait on just their back legs. But this is a Gulf Coast kangaroo rat, which is largely uh, 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 occurs only in South Texas. There's a South Texas sand sheet down here for most folks that don't know a large dune complex of a few million acres and then along our barrier islands and the Gulf Coast. But sandy, sparsely vegetated soils, eating the grasses of shrubs, uh, seeds of grasses and shrubs. Is where they occur. So there's a good look at one in some of the dunes. You see his burrow right there with the sand kicked out around it. Long tail, really strong back legs. He's got a little ear tag right there. Choney's part of that study. That same picture from earlier. You see, that's what a burrow looks like. So just a little one to two inch cross burrow. Lots of excavation around it, and you can see their little footprints right there. Those little long ski looking footprints as he comes around to his burrow. Here's one in the captive breeding program they had for it. So the Texas kangaroo rat is primarily a West Texas and high plain species, basically Wichita Falls points west, and then kind of Lubbock's in southwest out into to, to the Trans Pecos. They generally are root, <clears throat> generally putting their burrows on those graded roadsides or in the eroded roots of mesquite trees. Um, Miriam's kangaroo rat is another kangaroo rat species, mainly associated with West Texas. And one of the things that differentiates this one from the others is it only has four toes instead of five. Uh, and so that's one of the ways you can tell that species if you have it in hand. Ward's kangaroo rat is more largely distributed than a lot of the others, has five toes, uh, and is mainly in the western western half of the state. Uh, Banner-tailed kangaroo rat is another one, just another different kangaroo rat species that's out there. Um, as, we, as you can see, we've got a couple of different ones that occur throughout western parts of Texas in those sandy, droughty, arid regions of the state. So, like I said, I know we're blowing through this. It's just an untenable amount of species to cover in an hour and a half, two hours. So we're just going to go through them. So there was a, the rice rat there that has very limited distribution. Fulvus harvest mouse is one of the more common ones, along with that hispid cotton mouse that find in our area, especially in um, in grasslands. And so this one is just showing, we were talking about dentition earlier, how you can differentiate species. So if you found an owl pellet with various skulls in it, and you saw this notched upper incisor, you know it's a mouse skull, you know that comes from the non-native house mouse, as to where the harvest mouth has a groove on the front of its tooth and no notch. And so that could tell you it's that species. And just from an owl pellet, you'd be able to know what occurs in your location. So Texas mouse, it's a cool little guy. Again, that Atwater Eye name, that collection is by Mr. Atwater. He's tossed his name on there, mainly that central portion of the state up to the to the Red River. The brush mouse, highly omnivorous, uh, occurs in the mount, mountainous parts of Texas as well as portions of the high plains. White-footed mouse has a statewide distribution, uh, highly varial habitats, but it's the most common and widespread of the state, wall of paramiscus, all those mice species. The deer mouse, this is the one that's the primary reservoir uh, for the Sinombre virus, which is a strain of hantavirus, which is that disease that if, if you're in a dry environment and you're in an area with lots of, uh, not a very well ventilated area with lots of rodent droppings, you can get hantavirus. There's still cases in Texas every year, something you don't really want to get. But its underparts and its feet are white. So there's one in the trap looking up at us. So here's Hantavirus pulmonary syndrome. Hantavirus can cause issues with your lungs and your heart. 
Uh, as you can tell, the wetter it gets, generally there's very few cases. And as you get to drier environments, you can see New Mexico, almost 100 cases a year. Colorado, 80. Arizona, 67. Texas, 37. California, 55. And so on. Uh, most of it's going to occur in those dry environments with lots of droppings. So if you think of like you got an old bead shed, something like that, where you store food and a bunch of rats get in there, you probably want that to be pretty well ventilated before you can start sweeping that stuff out so you don't breathe in all that and get hunt the virus. Um, the primary reservoirs are deer mouse, white footed mouse, and cotton rats. Basically, just stay away from rodents, poop, and urine, and you're being in good shape. Um, dogs and cats can give people hunt the virus. That is, uh, my best of my knowledge, false. <laughs> uh, but uh, most people, excuse me, breathe in hunt the virus that's stirred up in those droppings when they're cleaning it up. So uh, if you open it up and let it air out for a while before you start cleaning it, you should be in good shape and prevent yourself from being able to pick up that disease. So the white ankled mouse, its distribution, the northern pig mouse, a real little guy, only in overgrown grassy areas where it likes to be. Hispid cotton rat, this is sort of the backbone of the Texas food chain. So if you have a, a open grassland, savanna type landscape with good grass coverage and a mix of wildflowers, you will have hispid cotton rats. As an example, I taught an intro to wildlife management lab uh, during my master's uh, time uh, in Nacogdoches at Stephen F. Austin. And we would sample, I think it was a little 12 acre field and no, six acre field, that's right. And we would catch upwards of 200 rats in a, one night, in night one for the first lap. And we would mark them with uh, these black light markers on their belly. So if we caught them again, we could hit them with a black light. Uh, and it would, or it would just show sometimes they were pink. So sometimes it would show up lightly still the next day. And the next lab would catch somewhere between 100 and 200 and generally would have less than a 10 to 20% recapture rate. So on a six acre field, sometimes we'd catch over three, 350 rats and only 10 to 20% would be recaptures from the previous day. So they can be hugely abundant. So these, in times of good rain, like we just had, had they can be explosive in their reproduction. And so if I'm a hawk, a falcon, a coyote, a bobcat, et cetera, it's, it's good times because there are lots of rats out there for me to eat in the, in the can be in the dozens per acre in the right habitat types. So eastern wood rats, these guys are huge. So uh, generally, particularly in the eastern half of Texas, they can create little middens that can hold lots of cool stuff. Uh, it's where they just gather up whatever they like and dump it in the spot. Um, if you've ever seen old piles of barbed wire with tons of seeds and grass and old bottle cans and, and beer cans stacked into them, it's probably a wood rat that's grabbed them and thrown them in there. But eastern wood rats are huge. I, we've caught some that weighed over a pound, uh, just gigantic rats. Uh, there's an example of a midden in West Texas using some moss and sticks that it piled up to hide in. Here's another one using pine straw and sticks uh, piled up. Another example here with acorns and pine straw as they develop theirs. So muskrats, these are species. It used to be another in popular fur bearer. They, they've been known to be in close distribution with beavers, even living in the same lodges or dams. Uh, roof rat introduced species primarily in urban areas. I've killed a lot of these as they come into my garden. Uh, in my old house, they would come in from from a area next door and try to steal my tomatoes at night. <laughs> so we would catch them. Uh, and so Norway rats, another introduced species that's common in urban areas, and then the house mouse, which is also introduced and can basically be, be found anywhere. So rabbits. So one of the easy ways to tell a rabbit skull is they have two sets of incisors, true incisors, and then these peg-like peg teeth behind it indicate a rabbit. So if you have a squirrel skull and a rabbit skull, the way to tell that difference is look at the incisors. If there's only one set of incisors and they're stained brown, it's probably a squirrel. If there's a set of incisors that's white with these two peg-like extrusions behind it, that's a rabbit skull. So we're going to blow through this. There's five species in Texas. Uh, Black-tailed jackrabbit, you'll see these in open areas all the way out uh, across the state, except for primarily just in the big thicket. Uh, generally most active right at dawn and dusk and into the night. Uh, swamp rabbits, which are slightly larger than eastern cottontails, generally found in the eastern part of the state. One of the most common ways we were able to identify where swamp rabbits were 
is in swampy or bottomland hardwood forest, one of the ways they mark their habitats because they're pretty in pretty lush environments is if there is a stump, for whatever reason, these rabbits like to jump up on those stumps and that's where they'll poop. Whether it be that's where they're looking out to see above the vegetation or it's a way for them to territorial mark, I don't know, but that's what they tend to like to do. They would poop on top of those stumps. And it was a good way to know that swamp rabbits were in that bottom. Uh, desert cottontail is primarily a West Texas species, slightly larger ears, uh, usually a slightly reduced body size. Um, and on the skull, the auditory bulla, the, the extrusion on the skull where for hearing, where the hearing structures are created, is usually larger on, than on a normal cottontail and coarse in texture on the bone rather than smooth. Eastern cottontail statewide, super variable. I've got some in my backyard here in the middle of College Station that pop up. And then I've seen them, you know, just about anywhere I've gone throughout the state. And then enlisted endangered in 2009. Um, this species is kind of, they're trying to determine whether it's its own species or not, but highly localized in the Davis, Guadalupe, and Chisos Mountains. It's not found in the grasslands around it because they're too dry. All these little desert sky islands and spinels exist. It's been uh, basically gone extinct in the Davis and Chisos Mountains. Uh, and it pretty much now just exists in the Guadalupe Mountains. And there's some debate about whether it's its own species or not, but it does exist out there. So these last ones are all ones that we're familiar with. Coyotes, they're everywhere. Omnivorous, uh, pretty much our top predator now in the state on a large basis. Red wolves uh, used to exist in the state, kind of intermediate between gray wolves and coyotes, a smaller eastern wolf. There has been some indication that the genetic uh, structure of these species still exist on the barrier islands of Galveston, uh, where they did some genetic work and found that about 80% of the what they thought were coyotes and 80% DNA markers of, of red wolves, but the only true red wolves non hybridized that we know of exist in North Carolina and the last ones were collected from Texas to take part in that North Carolina. Um, experiment where they've got a breeding population wild breeding population as well as. Uh, a closed population to keep red fox. This is an introduced species that was introduced for the fox hunting tradition that came from England and other other areas of Europe. Uh, but they're relatively common and distributed across the state, except for the more drier regions. You kind of see their distribution there. Swift fox, these are primarily a high plain species. Uh, used to really be associated with prairie dog towns and the like. Uh, very restricted in Texas now to just a few counties. The more common uh, fox species that we'll see that's native is the gray fox, which can actually climb trees. Uh, and this one is found throughout the state. Um, I see them every year, even have people send photos of them raising uh, families underneath their barn, underneath outbuildings and lounging in their backyards or side yards as we go through. Mountain lions used to be statewide, still get sightings data and road kills occasionally throughout the state, but the primary breeding populations that are known and of good distribution are in the Trans-Pecos region of West Texas, uh, portions of South Texas, and then a few locations, mainly along rivers in the Texas Panhandle. And then occasionally we'll get reports in Eastern Texas. And then the, y'all may know from uh, 2020, there was one killed east of Dallas. And the same one was actually documented west of Fort Worth in Dallas itself, along one of the creeks and greenways, and then where it was shot east of Dallas. And after that, the sighting stopped. It was a young male, actually it was a mature male, uh, distributing, they think from <clears throat> from what they could tell that it probably came from eastern New Mexico or the Texas Panhandle, based on some radio isotope type data they did um, that can kind of give you a geographic location where things exist based on radio isotopes. Bobcats statewide distribution our most common uh, native felid through that mainly a small predator rabbit squirrels rats mice pretty much strictly. Uh, uh, a carnivore can live to be up to 13 years old in the wild, but generally two to five years is a, a pretty long time for a bobcat to exist in the wild. Generally less than 20 pounds, most of the time closer to 15. Ocelots used to exist along the southern third of Texas, but now are only found in a few locations in four border counties with, the, with highly um, managed populations. Margays, there have been some Sightings, but the only known specimen came from Eagle Pass on the border in 1852. So it could have been transient. There's been nothing known since then. 
Uh, Jagger one Ds again, nothing really known about it. Less than 15 individuals in Texas is what's estimated, but there hasn't even been a sighting in 20 years. Jaguars, these used to exist in Texas. They were, there was one even killed near Mason, Texas around 1908 by two young boys. I think that was the last one known to have been shot in the state, but there are records and collections from the big thicket from West Texas. And even I think all the way up into around Abilene, um, Jaguars were taken at that time. There are occasional sightings in Western Texas, but as of now, there are no known Jaguars to have occurred in Texas in some time. Black bears, there are, there is, they used to be statewide in their distribution, but now just occur in West Texas. And there is a breeding population in most of the Trans Pecos and all the Sky Islands and Big Bend National Park, Big Bend State Park, Davis Mountains, uh, and Guadalupe Mountains National Park. There are known breeding populations there. There are sightings in East Texas. We have not documented breeding um, in that area. See their known distribution there for black bears. Grizzly or brown bears, there was there were two specimens killed in 1890, and the last one was killed in 1950. It was an old male, they think, came in from the Rocky Mountains. Uh, but there are only two known specimens, so probably accidental to uncommon in Texas historically. There was a seal species that occurred in the Gulf of Mexico, but no longer does. The last one was seen in 1932 off the coast of Texas. So these last ones, ringtails, can occur throughout the state, more common, basically I-35 and points west. Raccoons, you've all seen these guys. They're pretty much ubiquitous uh, and in all environments. Um, Black-footed ferrets, mink, badgers are all members of the weasel family that can occur. Uh, some are black-footed ferrets used to be associated with prairie dog towns. Badgers are strong burrowers. They've got that laterally flattened bodies, uh, but used to be prairie, ground squirrels, prairie dogs, uh, other mammals are their primary source of food. food. Very aggressive. They can even eat rattlesnakes and things like that. Uh, very aggressive guys. River otters are something that have really extended their range in the last 30 years across East Texas. I saw a roadkill otter just east of Temple uh, here recently along the San Gabriel River. That was just a month ago, uh, but they're kind of found throughout. And then skunks, so western spotted skunk. Some folks around y'all's area will call these civet cats, but eastern spotted skunk on a rapid decline, mainly associated with grasslands uh, and riparian woodlands, but really have not seen it in, in a long time. Most of it's based now on historical records. Uh, hooded skunks, another species. Striped skunks can even look like this. It can be kind of variable, but striped skunk is far and away the most common and well distributed throughout the state in the Winter time, early spring, everybody smells them when they get hit on the side of the road. Uh, they're ubiquitous. And then the hognose skunk, this distribution in Western Texas and then portions of the big thicket. So we're talking about rabies earlier. Uh, in Texas, which animal has the greatest numbers of rabies by abundance? Well, these are some of the areas that they're treating and stuff like that. But if you look at laboratory confirmed species and all species, skunk is far and away the most common, followed by bat. So skunks are in red, bats are in yellow. 2013, 2014, and so on. So with that, I'm going to have to break off before we get to the last few because I have got to get going. I apologize for that. Um, Thank you, but, Tim. Go, go, go. Take care of your daughter. Right. Yeah, sorry about that, everybody. And sorry, I'm not going to be able to stay for questions. But if so, or Ben, if you all want me to get back on at some later date, in July to finish up, I'm more than happy to because I feel like I did not do the service because I still got 18 more slides <laughs> over some of them. But uh, uh, if you all have any questions, please email me. Uh, and I can't wait to get back in person to meet with you all again to talk about mammals or grasslands or, or whatever else. So thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Tim. All right. You all have a great day. Zoe, you're on mute Very before I go. <laughs> Y'all be good. John. Yeah. All right. John Adkins is going to fill in for a little while for us, and then we're going to take a little break and we'll go on with the rest of our program. So thank you so much for uh, filling in at the last minute, John.
No problem. John, uh, hey. I've got just Go one. Ahead. I was going to say, I wasn't muted. I just, my laptop changes my mic every once in a while. Um, I just have one question that I can can tease out of the many, many conversations that were going on uh, that you might be able to speak to. Um, and I've I've uh, done this with a different species myself, but it was about relocating um, mammals. Uh, if you have property and you don't want them, they're not right for where you are and you want to try to just put them someplace, they'll be happy, but you may be raising territorial issues with that. Uh, whether it's coons, possums, my case was uh, rats because <laughs> I couldn't even kill a rat. But um, anyway, any thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, kill the rat. Um but other than that, it's it's not a territorial issue. Um, Texas Parks and Wildlife has concerns about possibly spreading diseases. So that's why fur-bearing animals, fox, coon, possums, et cetera, you know, you're not supposed to move them to another location. If you've got your own property, you can relocate them within your own property, but they don't want you trapping them and then dumping them somewhere else. But, you know, I, I'm not gonna, I'll leave it at that. So that's the, that's the rules. You're not supposed to trap them and dump them somewhere else. So, um, Tim talked about, he, he really, he got, <laughs> he accelerated at the end there, but he was talking about mountain lions. Um, Hopefully we um, bring back, we had a guest speaker in, talked about um, cats. There was a, we had a professional cat trapper for uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife Division that came and spoke to us um, a couple of years ago. We also had a guy that came and spoke to us about um, black cats. Uh, those would be good speakers to have in the future. The, uh, the black cat phenomena is something that you will come across when you're out there doing your um, engagements as nature interpreters. <laughs> you know, at Mother Neff or somewhere else, people are going to come up to you and ask you about this particular phenomena. So it's one of those things that you, you need to be ready for. Um, mountain lions, mountain lion range is expanding. It's not just expanding in Texas, but it's expanding everywhere. Um, actually, we had our first case of a, a death by mountain lion here in December. First one, I think, in 100 years or recorded history or whatever in Texas. But we had somebody up in Lipan, Texas. He was, it was deer season. He was probably going out to a deer stand or something because it was, they had seen him in the afternoon and then he went missing. And they, they think it was in the early morning hours, walking down a power line cut um, near Lipan. It was, it was like a mile and a half outside of town. But there was a, a stream and some wooded areas. And he, uh, he ran into something he wasn't ready for. And he, the... Uh, County Sheriff said it was the most gruesome scene he's ever come across. And he said he's been to a lot of accidents and seen some really bloody stuff. But the Texas Parks and Wildlife Division and USDA sent a um, expert, air quotes, expert on mountain lions up there. And they said, well, they couldn't find any sign that it was an animal attack at all. Well, they sent the body up to the coroner and the coroner came back and said he died from a bite to the back of the neck. Uh, that's a mountain lion. And we, what they do is they bite you on the back of the neck, the head, and then they unzip you and eat the soft stuff inside. So they're out there, folks. Uh, we had uh, what was deemed a mountain lion kill of a deer here in Salado, actually in, in the center of town in one of the parks a couple years ago. So, and they've had them in Austin also. They're out there. You just got to keep your eyes out for them. Um, otters, there are um, there are otters out here. Uh, I've seen them myself personally at um, Chalk Ridge Falls. I haven't seen them at Miller Springs. I know people that have seen them out at Miller Springs. So they're around here. Beaver, the um, 
I have seen beaver on Nolan Creek all the way up to almost near the source of Nolan Creek on Fort Hood. Beaver are really cool because they'll use whatever is at hand to build the dam. It's not always built with sticks like you see in a Bugs Bunny cartoon or something. They uh, will use corn stalks, rocks, mud, whatever to push up the water to get that level. And they're they're quite the engineer. They don't just build dams. What they do is they will also they'll build a dam and then they'll dig a channel to uh, a feeding location somewhere with a bunch of willow trees or something like that. They'll actually carve out a canal so they can go back and forth in water to their feeding area because they're much more comfortable and feel safer in water. So, um, yeah, I grew up hunting, trapping, fishing, like I told you. Um, if you've got questions about trapping or anything, please come up online right now. Ask, ask me whatever. I'm a fisheries and wildlife biologist. I, I focused on wildlife because I, I didn't want to be a fish squeezer. I didn't want to work in a fish hatchery squeezing fish for my whole life. So if you've got something you want to ask me, go ahead. There's a few questions that have come up at the end. If you want to look over on there, um, starting about coon removal, uh, if you don't relocate, you see that, and then a, a couple below. Okay. Uh, yes, there's chronic wasting in Texas. It's right now it's confined to a few counties. Um, that's a good, that's another good class. We could have our resident wildlife biologist for Texas parks and wildlife come in and talk to us about, cause that's one of their big focuses is they test every year and they, they check for a chronic wasting disease. <clears throat> But I think it's mostly down around Gillespie County and some of those other places down around there where they had, uh, for, for lack of a better term, deer farms. Where they're fenced in and they have their resident herds of deer. For um, least hunting and that's where they've seen some chronic wasting disease. But. Uh, how do you recommend killing raccoons? 22 caliber rifle between the eyes. Um, but uh, or a uh, good axe handle. Um, we are we are a release point for Austin. Wall. So on the other hand, there's places you can yeah. take them. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, you're not, like I, like I said earlier, you're not supposed, according to Texas Parks and Wildlife, you're not supposed to trap them and then relocate them. Um, I'll be honest, I've done it. I've got a wildlife management area within a mile of my house, so I just drop them off there. If there's rabies there, there's rabies here, is the way I kind of look at it, so. Um, black cats. <laughs> That's a whole can of worms because according to every um, parks and wildlife um, department of natural resources, whatever, in the uh, continental United States, they don't exist. So what are they? Um, they've been seen for since there's been people in America, but uh, what what exactly are they? Are they jaguars that still exist in the area? Are they uh, melanistic mountain lions? Who knows? Are they uh, jaguar rundies? Are they just a big old black tomcat that people see and take pictures? So there's quite a different uh, opinions on that. But like I said, be ready because people are going to come to you and they're going to tell you that they've seen this creature that supposedly doesn't exist. But I've been around long enough. I can I know that the Department of Natural Resources, uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife, other, you know, these organizations, they will tell you something doesn't exist because it's not good for publicity. It if it if they admit something exists, then they have issues with um, farmers, you know, livestock raisers, things like that. They said bobcats didn't exist in Iowa for years when we knew they did. They said the mountain lions didn't exist in Iowa 
for years when we knew they did. But since the advent of game cams, it's it's gotten a lot harder for these organizations, these governmental organizations to deny that they, they're there. Uh, <laughs> Chupacabra. <laughs> that's a, that's um that's out there okay i that's one that's that's on the really on the fringes as far as i'm concerned so uh beaver stick in the crib just, yeah john john yeah. just for fun i wish i would have remembered because i would have known this but uh we just recently when we were doing some birding discovered there is a bird group that are called chupacabra goat suckers actually uh goat suckers for some crazy reasons but it was funny to think there actually is a chupacabra out there but it's a bird yeah there is, yeah the goat sucker is a bird it's it's a related whippoorwill uh, nighthawks things like that right, the goat that's sucker. right <laughs> <laughs> um Questions, questions about trapping, any any mammal questions, whatever you have, go ahead and uh, come up online now. Uh, we're we're lo we're kind of tap dancing, filling in some time, waiting for uh, the next speaker to come up online. So, hit me. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. Why don't Why don't we go ahead and take a ten minute break? And thank you so much, John, for filling in and tap dancing. That was a beautiful dance. Um, oh, there's still got a, we got a couple questions. I can I can still talk to them. Okay. Uh, a jackalope? I don't know a jackalope. <laughs> um, no, there's no such thing as jackalopes, but there is actually a disease that they get that causes. Uh, Cretaceous growths on their head, so it looks like they they grow horns. So it that actually exists among um, jackrabbits. This disease that causes these growths to look like horns. Um, ringtails. Best place to see ringtails is west of the interstate. Um, they're out here. Um, some of our members have have caught them in their chicken coops and things like that. Um, I've never seen one in the wild um, because they're nocturnal, but I have seen them dead along a road west of here. So any, any, anybody that knows about, um, yeah, that knows about ringtails and spotting them in, in Bell County, go ahead and come up online right now and talk about it. Uh, Melissa is online, so we can we can go to the next. Okay, take your break then and uh, come back in 10 minutes. Hello, Melissa. Melissa, thank you so much for starting early. We appreciate it. Oh, no problem. I Everything looks a little different right now, so I'm going to try to figure out how to um, Sure, I'm assuming you all cannot see me. Is that correct? Not yet. Okay. So there should be a pop up menu down at the bottom. Yes. Okay, so start. There you go. Hi. <laughs> and I'm just Your trying. Screen to... is at the top. Is that right? Yeah, you can go to the top menu where it says uh, file edit share. And then share content. Well, 